Welcome to Lessons in Leadership. Steve Adubato, Mary Gamba. Hey, Mary, we said we were just going to we keep changing because we're taping like 10 shows in a day. We had been wearing same colors, coordination, without talking. Now I'm blue and you're... I am. I am. At least it's patriotic. Uh, but I did. I anticipated you were going to wear your maroon or your red tie and we would have matched. But that's okay. We don't always have to match. It's fine. But you see... When you have the general manager of the Somerset <laughs> Patriots, uh, we're joined by Patrick McGavery, president and general manager of the Somerset Patriots, the double A affiliate for the great. No, look at this guy. Yes. <laughs> he comes prepared. No, no, Patrick. First of all, Patrick, great to have you with us on Lessons in Leadership. Great to be here. Thank you so much. Real quick, I, I have a few props here. I'll pull out at different times. But Patrick, let's get this out of the way first. You've had so many great celebrities and talented people come and throw out the first pitch at the Somerset Patriots. As we show this video, um, you ran out of people to ask. So you and our great friends from Fedway, longtime friends, Rob Sansone and others, you asked me to throw out the first pitch. How would you describe the pitch that I threw to kick off uh, the game that I saw not too long ago in the summer of 2022? How would you describe it? You know, I've seen thousands of first pitches over the year, thousands. Um, and uh, yours was probably, if, let's just say it's a thousand first pitches, you're in the top 75 percentile as a decent first pitch. A ton of Hold on one second. To get this out of the way, Mary said, and others said, you have to throw it from the rubber. Could yes. you tell everyone why I threw it from the bottom of the mound, which was a, out of respect and courtesy to the Patriots? Well, that is true. Thank you, Steve. Um, we do we do request people to throw just in front of the mound, um, and that's just kind of the policy that we yeah. have. So he did go up on the mound, um, which you know is a little bit more difficult. But uh, yeah. nevertheless, he threw a pretty good pitch. And P.S. Well, I, I just want to can I go, go on the ahead. record, Stephen Patrick? I would love some point, even if it's after a game, because my only argument was, and Patrick just hit it on the head, that if you throw a pitch from the mound, you're so much higher. So it's automatically going to sink. So that was my theory. So I didn't have any doubt that if you were in front of the mound, I think I could throw a strike from the front of the mound. I played Whoa. softball for 15 years. All I'm right. just saying. Okay. And Mary, Mary, you're up next. You got, I, you, I'm in. I, I am not afraid of it. We're there all the time. We got our dog there for bark in the park all the time. Love your fireworks. Oh. But I just say uh, from the mound, that's where I, I worried about Steve's accuracy. Let me just say that that was the most pathetic effort to being to actually asking if you could throw out the first pitch I've oh, ever. Oh no, no, no! I, I'm not asking. I don't. I don't want to do it. Okay. <laughs> Enough about us. Enough about us. P.S. Derek, the great Derek Jeter, when the Yankees honored him recently, threw his pitch from down there, same place, and I threw a strike. He did not. That being said, Patrick, the connection between baseball and leadership is. Connection. Well, you know, as a leader, um, what are you doing as a leader? You're trying to make people better around you, right? And that's what baseball is all about. I mean, there, this is a team out there on the field working together for to achieve one goal, and that is to win a ball game uh, and win a championship. Not much different. I actually use an, an analogy a lot with my staff. Is we're a team here, uh, our front office team, our event staff, and one common goal is to put on a great show every night here at the ballpark. So. There is a lot of uh, parallels between the two. And your leadership philosophy and approach, because again, in all seriousness, being there that night with, with our sons and our, and our daughter, um, who also mocked my first pitch big time. <laughs> um, but I'm gonna say this, one of the things that struck me was how well organized things are, were and are, how pleasant people are as soon as you walk in. And I'm thinking, that just doesn't happen. Yeah. We're, does your leadership quote philosophy come from broad question? I know. Yeah. You know, uh, and I, I appreciate you saying that. And we do take pride in uh, making this a, a culture of, of fun, um, togetherness, family. Uh, we have employees, event staff employees that have been here since we opened the ballpark for the first time in 1999. Uh, we have a front office staff that have been here for 20 plus years. So, but we do try to cover every detail and, you know, fans, experience here at the ballpark really relies on your staff and making sure you are prepared for them. So we go over every little detail in a game day meeting. In fact, I just left the game day meeting. Uh, it was about an hour long for tonight's game. 
Uh, we go over every little detail, make sure we have, you know, anybody throwing your first pitch, a group that's moving on the field, who we need to visit, who our mascot needs to go take a picture with, whatever it may be. We're covering every aspect of, of, the, of the game tonight. Yeah, I'm going to follow up with Patrick in a little bit, Mary, about what we call strategic micromanagement, which is my excuse for being a micromanager. Go ahead, Mary. Go ahead. Yeah, well, I was just going to say, Steve is so right. I've been there dozens of times every summer. My kids, when they were young in Little League, they went out on the field. They got to run the bases. We did the bark in the park. We did everything. And everything from the people that you pay your 5 or $10 to get in the parking lot to the people that take your ticket. How do you ingrain that, though? I know you just said you had a meeting. But mm -hmm. Steve and I have this theory, and I've actually bought into it. It took a long time. Everyone is a leader, from that guy in the parking lot that's taking the ticket to the person that's checking your ticket to the beer vendor. Thank you for the beer vendors. And <laughs> how do you, um, and thank you for having gluten-free beer, too. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. And how do you make sure, though, that everybody truly embraces that they are a leader, that they are part of that experience? Because obviously, you're doing something right in that regard. Yeah, you know, it, it is a, you know, it's a mindset, you know, and, and that mindset simply is treat others how you want to be treated. So think about when you go to a game and, and as a fan, as we're a staff going to a game, how do we want to be treated uh, to a restaurant or a movie? Um, you know, we want a, a clean place. We want good food. Um, obviously, we want to be taken care of. So, you know, we, we do talk about this, and this is a big part of what we talk about in the off season uh, each day. You know, we have, when our event staff gets here, we we have about a 15, 20 minute meeting with them. We reinforce that with them. Smile, you know, have fun. This is a baseball game. You know, you know, people are coming here to kind of forget their everyday life and they're here to have a good time. So we do reinforce that. Uh, but I do believe, you know, our late owner, Steve Caliper, kind of ingrained that with us. Uh, he treated everybody as a friend, as a family member, and uh, it kind of trickled down from there. Yeah. And, you know, interesting, I mentioned before the introduction to Patrick and the, the great Somerset Patriot family uh, come through our friends at Fedway, one of your longtime uh, associates and friends, and I believe an uh, incoming board member is, uh, is Rob Sansone, as we talked about. We actually have a Fedway Leadership Academy. And one of the subjects we actually do talk about is, quote, strategic micromanagement. Question, and I'm going to move to something else. I'm going to move to the issue of confidence, believe it or not, Mary, because I've been thinking a lot about confidence, leadership, and baseball. Do you consider yourself, Patrick, a micromanager? That's a great question. You know, uh, I took over as general manager here in 2002. Uh, I had worked here for, for about four years prior to that. And when I took over, I was just about 32 years old. Uh, I didn't, you know, I had some experience managing people. I managed a restaurant for a couple of years, um, but it was a bit overwhelming. You know, my, my manager, I needed to, the field manager was Sparky Lyle, who was a, a, a legend in himself and uh, you know he kind of the old salty baseball guy here I'm talking to him about players um, you know I had a staff with a lot of the staff at the time event staff and, and our full-time staff was older than me so you know I think that confidence grew and I remember something Steve always said to me back then this is one one of our first conversations when we sat down at, uh, at a restaurant and we're talking about leadership and managing and management style and uh, I always try to really in my entire life, kind of look at him as, as a mentor. This is Steve Caliper talking to you? Yeah, Steve Caliper. The late, great Steve Caliper. Go ahead. I'm sorry. And he said, the most important thing is to be consistent um, with people, you know, and employees. You want to be consistent and confident. So, you know, if, if you're saying something that needs to get done and doesn't get done, well, you need to be consistent with them. Um, you need to be consistent on giving people positive feedback or maybe it's constructive criticism. But as long as you're consistent, confident uh, and calm, it's really important, I think, that uh, that comes across as a leader. Yeah. Mary, the confidence thing, and I'll tell you, and I know I'm going to date myself, we're taping this in the fall of 2022, we're hoping and praying that the Yankees will, in fact, wind up where they're supposed to be, and the Patriots continue to do well. But I, I was there, uh, along with thousands and thousands of others, going up to the Patriots games and watching Anthony Volpe again at the time he's a great shortstop for the Patriots um, one day who knows where Yankees who knows but here's my point I've seen a lot of ball players you have as well and Mary this is not about baseball but they're great players and all of a sudden they quote lose their confidence mm. first of all Mary as I before I go to Patrick do you actually believe you can lose it 
I do. It's the mental. I always go back to Tin Cup, that movie. It's one of my favorite golf <laughs> movies of all time. Kevin <laughs> and Kevin Costner, and he's got like this whole apparatus on. He's like leaning over in the ball and they're, you know, he's trying to like, you know, really get it back. And, and to me, confidence, it's a mental game. And when uh, an athlete loses his or her confidence to me, no, they're not losing their talent. Their ability is still there. It's just that muscle memory between the brain and the muscles. And then they start to second guess themselves. So to me, that's really what confidence is when you tie it to leadership and athletes. It's not that they lost their ability to hit a ball. They're just overthinking, if that makes sense. Yeah, I saw Joey Gallo have a problem in New York and then oh. went to the Dodgers. <laughs> I just have to do a shout out to my dad. Patrick watches every sun every single Sunday, he watches Lessons in Leadership, major Yankees fan. Oh, awesome. And every time that Gallo got up at bat, I saw his blood pressure. He's like, come on, hit the ball. It was just oh, man, so I, dad. I, I felt Patrick, I really did. But then he goes I, to the Dodgers and I hope he keeps doing well. Same guy or not, very confident. What's up mm -hmm. with confidence, baseball, and leadership? Go ahead, Patrick. Absolutely. You know, Mary, Mary nailed it. It is a mental state, you know. And, and you know, as far as, as, let's say Aaron Judge right now, how, how, how much is he flying on confidence when he's up to bat? Uh, he is uh, probably hit 58 and 60, maybe 58 to 59 to 60 this weekend, or this week at, at the Red Sox. So, you know, it, it is a big thing. It is mental. And I tell you one thing, and you mentioned micromanager, and I think I was a micromanager um, when I first started as a as the GM here. Uh, but, you know, one of the important things I also learned is to trust people, trust your employees, trust they'll make the good decisions. You can't be involved with everything. In fact, when you are involved with everything, what happens is it kind of wears out the employees because they're kind of, <laughs> you're kind of, you know what I mean? So you have to be kind of a yeah, man. You you're kind of overseeing, taking a bird's eye yeah. view of, of, of what they're doing. And that's really important because there's so many different facets of, of this operation. Um, but, yeah, baseball. You know, a sales guy who's losing confidence because he can't sell something, that's a mental thing. So what do you do? You, you have to bring them in, talk to them, you know, really try to boost them up. And, uh, and hopefully, you know, they can get that confidence back. Uh, to Patrick McVeary, the entire terrific family, the team at the Somerset Patriots, um, we say thank you. We say thank you to our friends, our family at Fedway for making this connection. And we cannot uh, thank you enough for joining us on Lessons in Leadership. All the best to Thank the you. Patriots team and uh, go to the games. They're great games. They're fun. It is a great experience and they're a terrific team. And Patrick, thanks so much. I appreciate you having me on. Thank you so much. You got Lessons in Leadership right back after this. This edition of Lessons in Leadership is made possible by the Bucino Leadership Institute at Seton Hall University, Prager Metis, Valley Bank, the International Union of Operating Engineers, Local 825, the North Ward Center, the New Jersey Sharing Network, Delta Dental of New Jersey, Kessler Foundation, Veolia, Resourcing the World, and Seton Hall University, showing the world what great minds can do since 1856. This is Mary Gamba. If you want more leadership tips and tools, log on to stand-deliver.com. That's stand-deliver.com. Promotional support for this edition of Lessons in Leadership with me, Steve Adubato, and my colleague, Mary Gamba, has been provided by NJ.com, NJBIA, and New Jersey Business Magazine, CIANJ, and Commerce Magazine. This is the Seton Hall story, one that comes to life every day on our campus. This is the place where great minds discover, innovate, collaborate, and find their true calling. This is the place where passion has a purpose, where learning inspires leading. The bonds we make, the values we teach, inspire our community to take heart and take action. This is Seton Hall University. This is what great minds can do. Welcome back to Lessons in Leadership, Steve Adubato, Mary Gamba, and uh, Nick Adubato, uh, not our son, Mary, my son, well, with my wife, Jen, we had a son. <laughs> I'm like, do you want to clarify that for our viewers? Yes, that would be yes. Steve Adubato's son, not my and son. And I'll explain, I'll explain Nick being on in just a moment. Uh, and it's not to analyze my pitch at the Somerset Patriot game, which he said was a 95 mile an hour fastball down the middle. That's Mary, what I heard. Ahead, 
You go ahead, stop. Tell everyone who our funders are, and then I'll talk about how great my pitch was. Yeah, definitely. If you're watching us, first and foremost, go to stand-deliver.com. You can catch past episodes of Lessons in Leadership, tons of free articles that Steve has written in columns. Thank you to our funders. We have Veolia, the New Jersey Sharing Network, Valley Bank, Prager Metis, Seton Hall University, and the Seton Hall Bacino Leadership Institute, International Union of Operating Engineers, Local 825, Northward Center, Kessler Foundation, and Delta Dental of New Jersey. So thank you to all of our generous uh, underwriters who make this possible. Mary, I hate correcting you on camera. I believe you said the national, it's the international. Why don't, no, I, I think international, sorry, international. Yes. Got it. Yes. So uh, shift gears. Nick, thank you for joining us on Lessons in Leadership. How are we doing? I'm good. Well, thank you for having me, Dad and Mary. This is uh, something I enjoy doing, and I'm very happy to be here. So, I think this kid was media trained. I love it. it he's <laughs> just so—he's like a little mini you. I love it. You should have had him dress up in one of your suits, just like you. That would have been hysterical. Yeah. Uh, well, I intentionally didn't put on my navy blue pinstripe suit, but you know, <laughs> you'd be the only suit jacket the only suit I've ever wear. Wear. <laughs> So, uh, hey, listen, we have Nick on because Mary and I have been talking about coaching, teaching, and I'm writing about this in this new book that I'm writing with Mary called Lessons in Leadership 2.0, colon. Mary, what about the, the tough, tough stuff? stuff? Just yeah, the right just word. the tough stuff. Mm -hmm. name, yeah, the tough stuff. And so there's a chapter in it called the F word. Mary, the F word, the full title is? Is, yes, it is. Uh, oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. Now I'm panicking. Forced mm -hmm. engagement. It's forced engagement, facilitation, and... Those are the only F words we're talking about. So here's the thing. Exactly. So the whole idea, and frankly, Nick doesn't even realize this, he became part of the chapter. Because my obsession as a leader, when I'm running a meeting or doing a seminar, and I've talked to Mary about this, I came up with the concept of forced engagement. And Sylvester in post-production will talk about what we mean by that and some lessons to engage people. The whole goal is this. You've got to engage people. You've got to pull them in, especially yep. remotely, because they're checking out. They're on their phone. They're texting. They're on Instagram, emails. God know what, knows what. But when I wrote that chapter, Nick, there's a section here about you. You happen to be a senior in high school at the time. And I'm looking at Nick, and without reading it, the I chapter, can tell you, yeah. Mm -hmm. I said, Nick, what are you doing? And he, was, he said, I'm in class. I said, you're in bed, and you're in your sweats. He goes, but I'm in class. I said, but are you on camera? He said, no, of course not. So I said, well, how could you be in class if you're not on camera? And then he goes, well, that's what we do. And I said, well, does the teacher engage you? And he goes, what do you mean? I said, does the teacher call you out by name and ask you questions? He goes, quote, not everyone puts people on the spot the way you do. Now Nick is in, now, I, Nick, literary license, okay? Okay, I understand, yeah. Now Nick is in university life. We'll talk about that in a moment. Nick. How important is it from your perspective as a student to be engaged remotely or in person? Let's talk remotely in a second. We'll talk about in person in a second. When you were not on camera, when you were just hanging out, how engaged were you? Um, I mean, that's about the bare minimum of being engaged. And every, you know, looking back at my years of schooling and even now, every class where I feel as though I've learned the most and uh, received the most valuable instruction and information it was a class where we were forced to engage. Um, and not only that, but people wanted to learn. And it's because of that engagement that people wanted to learn. And being online and uh, not having that can really be a detriment to not only yourself, but the environment as a whole. But, but Mary, and I, as I talked about Nick, and I'm, I'm sure being one of our kids, it's a pain in the neck because anytime they use filler or, or words like, like, you know, kind of, or um and ah, I drive them crazy and stop them and say, what do you really mean? But I'm also, I'm sure I'm drove Nick crazy because I'm like, you got to be on camera. You've got to be engaged. Mary, forget about school for a second, university, life, uh, higher ed, high school, in meetings. We've had meetings with others who, quote, not on camera, Mary? Correct. And, and Nick, first of all, amazing job. And I love, I could see you were pausing and thinking to not use those communication fillers. Yeah. So I could see well, you have learned, you have learned very well. And we, we coach, you know, boy. I'm sorry. that's your boy. 
you've done it you've arrived and uh but yeah it, i mean the pandemic has taught us so many things over the past almost three years but we this is the new way of communicating if you're going on a job interview if you're looking to get an internship if you're looking to apply to a graduate program uh to pursue a postgraduate education you're going to be interviewed on zoom and if you're looking down here if you're looking over here if you're not aware of your body language and what you're saying and how you're saying it you're not going to get that job over somebody else that is very conversational approachable smiling and making that eye contact with the camera on yeah nick so let's follow up on what mary just said mm -hmm. i i said i'm a big fan of calling people by name so nick out of let me ask you a question you read chapter blah 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 what's the most significant lesson or you took away from that chapter i believe how else are you going to let that person know you're asking them a question? But I bet there are a fair number of younger people and others who think how you are putting people on the spot. What do you say about that? Well, I mean, personally, I think that's the best way to facilitate engagement and conversation and discussion in a classroom. Um, but it does seem that that tactic or method, however you want to put it, has fallen out of favor particularly among students, they find it uncomfortable or somehow pressuring or anxiety inducing at times. And while I can understand that, the goal of a university in particular is to learn and to better your understanding and thinking skills. And if you're not challenged to do so, then what are you really doing? But without having the forced engagement, without having someone there to push you and challenge you to think you it's a you're wasting your time essentially but it does nick, seem I'm, sorry, I'm sorry nick and money because i know i wrote a check well, to to the university you happen to be at right now yes so that, that this, as well nick. just stay on this nick mm -hmm. we'll do a separate section on on listening where i interrupt all the time so <laughs> uh, you ready mary nick said something so insightful about some people are uncomfortable and I always say, and you know this, to grow, you have to get comfortable being uncomfortable. So Nick, if everyone stays in their comfort zone, okay, don't call on anyone because they might feel pressured or stressed. I get, okay. And they sit back. Don't you believe on some level, a, a teacher, a professor, a leader's job, a facilitator job is to make people get comfort more comfortable over time being just a little uncomfortable and getting through it and realize you're not going to die in the process. Go ahead, Nick. Well, absolutely. I mean, there's active learning and there's passive learning. So if you're active in the classroom and you're active, not only in the classroom, but, you know, in your studies and talking to people outside of the class and uh, facilitating conversations that are fruitful about the material, um, then, you know, you're actively learning. Uh, if you're passive and you sit back and you don't raise your hand, you don't offer your insight or opinion, you're just not going to learn as well. Um, it might be uncomfortable. It might be unusual. But at the same time, without having that element of going and getting it, so to speak, yeah, you're not going to have the same outcome as other students who do that. And if a professor or teacher isn't doing that, then I, and the, the fact of the matter is they are failing the class and the student in yeah. some way. And the same thing is true in leadership. Mary, Nick is one of those young, I mean, he's not a kid, one of those young people who puts his hand up and says what he wants to say. He's always been that and that kind of kid. And frankly, I didn't appreciate it when he was younger, when he just told me what he thought. And I was like, no, just do what I tell you. That didn't work. Mary, in meetings, and the same three or four people mm -hmm. being assertive. Doesn't that mean the rest of us as facilitator leaders have to pull the others who are more, as Nick said, they're hanging back, very passive. Well, that I'd rather listen. Mm -hmm. That's okay yeah. to a point, but then it's not. Go ahead, Mary. It is. And it's so hard as a leader because it's easier when we're facilitating our seminars to engage with those three or four participants who are charismatic, they're engaging, they're passionate about the topic. Sometimes, you know, if you're trying to pull in somebody and they're not as into the topic, it, it's like you're literally just pulling it out of them. But that's what we're here for as teachers, as educators, to teach others how to really find these skills within themselves because the skills are there. They just need to be watered and, and fostered and, and brought out. 
So here we go. Nick, we're going to do this. You're going to actually be a part of a seminar we're doing right now. we got three or four minutes left. Uh, the graphic's going to be up. What do we call it, Mary? The keys to engaging? Uh, yes, exactly. The And we're just going to go with engaging others. Engaging others. I apologize. Here are some keys. React to them quickly because you want to go through these. Number one, you're the quarterback slash point guard of the conversation, first bullet. You have to move the ball around. You have to facilitate, set other people up with a real bigger basketball than this. You ready? Next, ask uh, specific questions of specific people by name. Not Mary, anyone? Bueller? Anyone? anyone? Bueller? What will Bueller? Be, what will be Mary? Oh, uh, Ferris Bueller's day off. What happens when you ask uh, anyone? Please. Yeah, you're going to hear crickets. Nobody knows that you're talking to them. Next, hey, Nick, how about this? Ask probing, open-ended questions versus, Nick, do you agree with, with Mary? Do you agree with Mary? What are the two options if I ask if you agree, Nick? Yes or no. <laughs> yeah, right. That's not a conversation. But if I ask Nick, what's the number one lesson you've taken away from this experience? Don't you have to talk more? You have to think, too. How, you have to what? You have to think as well. Could you imagine getting people to think? How dare we? <laughs> uh, next, how about this one? Nick, I don't know if you like this one or not. Mm -hmm. To facilitate and engage, you must have, quote, high energy. I know mine is too high too often. Nick, I believe, I just saw the eye roll, Nick. Yep. <laughs> from, wait, from me, or, from me or from Nick? Or was it both of us? <laughs> both. Nick, I say you got to bring it. As a professor, as a leader, you say, go ahead. Yeah, you absolutely have to bring it. You know, people feed off energy. I mean, when you look at sports, any sports team that has a charismatic leader or quarterback point guard, as you put it, uh, ultimately wins. And people want to play for that person. Say you have a coach who's particularly charismatic. I'm looking at a picture of Vince Lombardi currently. And when you have someone like that, any kind of leader, people want to rally behind that person and feed off the energy they put out there in the world. And if you go into a meeting leading it or a classroom, you're like, hey, okay, today we're going to cover it. That's what's going to happen in the room, the classroom or the meeting or virtually. A couple other quick points. You must be present when you are engaging others, meaning do not be distracted. you got six other meetings. you got all these text messages. Stay present. Next, listen. Really listen. Meaning uh, my dad, and I, I know I have uh, 90 seconds left. My dad used to ask a question when he ran a meeting, then he would tell you the answer. Ask the question and let stop, Nick. Stop with the eye roll. I mean, it's such a bad idea having him on. It's a, he's in my library doing this. That's all I'm going to say. Uh, and one more thing follow up when someone, Nick, says something or you say something, Mary, listen, follow up. And even if you disagree, be open and don't criticize. To facilitation and engaging, Mary, final words on this? Does it make any sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, totally makes sense. 100%. And Nick, I want to give you the final word. I'm going to, you know, throw the ball to you. What one tip tool, 20 seconds or less, do you give to our viewers watching today to be more engaging and force that engagement? You know, whether or not other people or outside influences are forcing you, you should really dig deep and try to force yourself to facilitate where there is no facilitation. So if you're in a class discussion or you're in a seminar, whatever it happens to be, and there's not discussion going on, take the initiative, which I know is a word like that, and um, put it upon yourself to do it because no one else is going to do it for you. So that's that great. Was that my is final leadership. Word. That's leadership. I'm sorry, Nick. That's my son. Elvin is saying, say goodbye. And Nick, I am very proud of you. Mary and I are proud of you on behalf of the very entire proud. lesson in leadership uh, family. We will soon be working for Nick Adubato, all of us one day. Thank you, Nick. Thank you, Mary. Lessons in Leadership. See you next time. This edition of Lessons in Leadership is made possible by the Bucino Leadership Institute at Seton Hall University, Prager Metis, Valley Bank, the International Union of Operating Engineers Local 825, the North Ward Center, the New Jersey Sharing Network, Delta Dental of New Jersey, Kessler Foundation, Veolia, Resourcing the World, and Seton Hall University, showing the world what great minds can do since 1856. This is Mary Gamba. If you want more leadership tips and tools, log on to stand-deliver.com. That's stand-deliver.com. Promotional support for this edition of Lessons in Leadership with me, Steve Adubato, and my colleague, Mary Gamba, has been provided by NJ.com.
NJBIA, and New Jersey Business Magazine, CIANJ, and Commerce Magazine.